How's it going, everybody? Hope everybody's doing well. Today, are we live? We are, okay. Today's live is gonna be a little bit different than usual. Um, sometimes with these lives, I start kind of babbling on and talking about all sorts of stuff, but today, we are talking about sous vide and pretty much exclusively talking about sous vide. So we'll do about 30 minutes. Hopefully, I can limit it to 30 minutes talking about just the basics and things that are important when I think about sous vide. And then after that, we're gonna do some Q&A. Um, there is a little curveball that was thrown at me relatively recently um, as we were getting this set up. I realized everything I write is actually backwards. So right now the charts look normal, but when I write them, they're flipped. Um, so please bear with me. Uh, we'll see what happens, and yeah. What's up everybody, Trey, how you doing? Let's do it. Okay, so guys, as I mentioned, we're talking about sous vide, and this right here is a sous vide setup. So there's a, there's a couple elements that are important. We have the actual sous vide itself. Um, well, I'll start with this. So first we have this pot, right? You can really use any sort of container as long as it's uh, safe to go up to relatively high temperatures. So we have the container, it's filled with water. I think of it almost as like a little mini bathtub. So we have our little mini bathtub and then we have the engine that keeps it hot. I'm actually gonna shut this off right now. But this, for people that haven't used one or seen one, is, oh wow, okay. A little bit of a spillage situation, but this is a sous vide. They come in different sizes. You can see this is uh, a Nova, I think it's like the, it's called the Mini or something, but um, at this point they're fairly affordable. I think like five or six years ago when I first got one they were super expensive, but this is a sous vide, and you put it in your little mini hot tub, and it regulates the temperature of the water, as I mentioned, um, and yeah, it keeps it hot to a very specific temperature. So those are the first two elements. And then the next is what we're actually cooking on the inside. So here we have all sorts of stuff. I'm pretty excited to show you guys. Uh, a little bit later on, we're gonna cut into everything. Um, but yeah, we have our food and it, I'm gonna be honest, it looks a little sketchy at this point. Um, it ends up looking a lot better by the end of the process. But what you do is you put the food, it can be meat, it can be vegetables, it can be all sorts of stuff, and you vacuum seal it. Um, you either vacuum seal it or use a Ziploc. Ziplocs actually surprisingly can go up to pretty high temperatures and still be uh, safe. But you put your food in, this, in the uh, uh, vacuum sealed bag and you put it inside and you cook it to a specific temperature and cook it for a specific amount of time. So that's the general physical elements of the sous vide. Um, now we're gonna go on to more, not theoretical things, but things that I uh, think about as I'm sous videing. And I guess the, where, we're, where we're gonna start, we have our um, charts here. Again, everything I write is gonna be backwards, so I'm gonna do my best to write uh, backwards, which is, <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, I'm not that good at it, but um, we're getting there. So the first thing to think about is what makes sous vide different than a traditional cooking method? So let's first talk about like an oven. Okay, we're gonna start with an oven. Let's say you put your oven to, so first and foremost, what is this chart? We have temperature and we have time. Can you guys see, can you see that, Sophia? The words yeah. themselves? Yeah. Okay, so we have temperature right here on the y-axis and we have time on the x-axis. Okay, so let's say we set our oven to 350 degrees. We're gonna, did I write that correctly? Is that 350 backwards or did I miss up, mess up the three? <laughs> the, the three should be. See, I already messed up. I was, I like, I did a little bit of training. This is it, right? The, okay, 350, okay. The other way, so you want the three to be where the zero is. What? Oh my God. You left. No, it says 350. What are you talking about? Am I seeing something different than you're seeing? Guys, can you see 350 right? Oh, it's backwards for, wait, what? Hold up, wait a minute. What do you see when I write this? Um, wait, you know, YouTube is backwards. Oh, okay, so Instagram is we're doing YouTube and we're doing Instagram and apparently, oh wow, that is confusing. Hmm, all right. 
on the fly. What are we gonna do here? I have another board. I think that let's just let's just stick with one way. So <laughs> for wh whoever it's backwards for, unfortunately, we're gonna have to deal with it. Feel free to move over to either Instagram or YouTube Live, um, and let's just let's just do it the way that I had originally yeah. planned. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry about this, guys. Oh man, it's tough. Three no. Three fifty. Does that say three fifty on either or? Damn. Okay, so for Instagram it should say three fifty, right? Oh. Oh. Guys, bear with me. I'm very sorry. This is uh. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so for Instagram, it's correct now. Yeah. For YouTube, it's backwards. Yeah. Okay, people on YouTube, I apologize. Um, feel free to move to Instagram Live, or I'll just vocally explain what's going on here. Okay, now we're talking about a traditional cooking math method as opposed to sous vide, just to kind of visualize why one would sous vide something. So let's say you have your oven set to 350, right? We have our temperature here, and we have our time here. Okay, next we have here. Let's say we're cooking a roast and we want the internal temperature to, to finish at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So it's in an ambient environment of 350 and we want it to get to 130. Okay, so we have 350 and we have 130. Okay, so you put your roast in, you're cooking it, right? Over time, the roast's internal temperature is getting closer to 350 because that's the, that's the ambient environment temperature. So we're going up, we're going up, we're going up, we're going up, and then boom, we hit 130 degrees Fahrenheit. It's cooked perfectly. However, there's a problem because Max is distracted. There's an emergency. Things are happening in the world. I'm not in the kitchen. So unfortunately, the roast continues to cook, right? This happens sometimes and we've now overcooked our roast because it continues to get closer to this 350 degree temperature. So boom, we've hit 350, I take it out, disaster, right? Okay, that's a traditional cooking method and that's why things get overcooked. Now, we have another situation, okay? And this is gonna be sous vide and one of the main benefits to sous vide things, in my opinion, okay? So remember that sous vide bath I showed you guys, that little miniature hot tub? We're going to set our sous vide bath to 130 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? So now the cooking environment is at 130 degrees. So we put our roast in, and, and, it's, and 130 is also the finishing temperature that we want to achieve when cooking this roast, right? So we put the roast in, the temperature of the roast is going up, right? It's going up, it's going up, it's going up, until boom! We hit the perfect temperature, right? Great. But once again, Max is distracted. Something's happening and I'm not there to take the roast out. In this situation, the roast can't keep increasing in temperature because the cooking environment is 130 degrees. So unlike the oven where it would keep going up, in this case, it's plateaued. And until the end of time, we can never overcook our roast, All right? Do you guys kind of visualize how that's happening? And it's because the cooking environment is limited to this temperature. It's impossible for it to get higher. And this to me is one of the core benefits to sous vide things. And it's why you get that perfect edge to edge medium rare for cooking a steak. Um, and it just allows for a lot of flexibility when cooking a variety of different things. So that's the first element. Um, hopefully this visualization was helpful for the people on YouTube where everything's completely backwards. I apologize. Um, but that's the first thing. Um, and so for questions, I'm, I'm, I see questions coming up. All, all Q&A is going to happen after um, we, I, I explain everything. So again, I'm going to try to limit it to about 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, and then we're going to do a bunch of Q&A after. Okay, so that's the first element. The next thing I want to talk about is temperature as a concept. So I'm just going to make this right here. So for me... Um, as I was learning about sous vide and cooking in general, conceptualizing temperatures beyond 100 degrees Fahrenheit was a little bit confusing. 
you know, as humans, we rarely experience anything above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Like if it gets super hot, it's 100. If it's super cold, it's zero. But for example, the difference between 130 degrees Fahrenheit and 160 degrees Fahrenheit, it's so theoretical, right? Like we would never actually physically experience that. Um, so it's hard to understand it. However, in cooking, that's where all the magic happens, right? Between 100 degrees and 200 degrees, it's theoretical at in terms of how we experience it, but with cooking, it's extremely important. So there's a few temperatures in this range um, that I just wanna quickly talk about. This is useful for sous vide and it's useful for pretty much all sorts of things when it comes to cooking. So again, we're writing backwards here, but at the low end, we have 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Up here, we have 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Can you, does that say 200 on Instagram and 100? So we have 200 degrees Fahrenheit, we have 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We live around here, right? Well below 100 degrees Fahrenheit normally. But again, this is where all the magic happens when cooking. So I'm just gonna talk about a few things that happen in this, in this space. First, we have boiling water, right around 212 degrees Fahrenheit, so a little bit above this. Water boils at 212. Here, I'm gonna write BBQ. When you're cooking things low and slow, like a brisket, like uh, pulled pork, ribs, ribs are a little bit lower, probably closer to 190, but when you're cooking things that require low and slow cooking and require tenderization at high temps, 200, around 200, 205, 210, this is where you're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna be doing barbecue. Okay, let's go back down to here. 100 degrees, I'm gonna write hot tub because that's roughly where, again, writing backwards, but I feel like I'm doing good at it. Um, right around 100 is where like, you know, you sit in the hot tub, that's that temperature. Here, we have 130, okay? Um, 130, again, so for people that are on YouTube and this is all backwards, head over to Instagram. Um, I guess I should probably just be writing it normally and the people on Instagram, <laughs> I can't see it correctly, should go to YouTube. Yeah. Either way, we're too far along, we're writing backwards today. Okay. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, so, right now we're conceptualizing temperatures beyond 100 degrees Fahrenheit where humans don't naturally um, live. So 130 Fahrenheit, I'm gonna write beef. So, this is, this is a general uh, temperature, depending on the cut, depending on how you're cooking it. Um, but for me, 130 is how I visualize, okay, a steak at medium rare is around 130, okay? 130. Next we have 145F, uh, okay. 145 Fahrenheit, and that's gonna be pork, again. If it's pulled pork, completely different, it's gonna be in the barbecue section. But if you're doing like a tenderloin, like a pork tenderloin or a, or a loin, something like that, around 145 is where I think about pork being. Next we have 160, what's that? 165. Okay, does that say 165? Yeah, okay. 165 and we have chicken. Okay, so again, if it's light meat, if it's, if it's white meat or it's dark meat, it really uh, differs. But this to me is like when I'm going into cooking a piece of protein, I have these like ingrained in my brain, but it took me a while to kind of start to, to think of it this way. Um, everybody, I, I hope, should consider getting a thermometer. Um, it's extremely important. And yeah, so th these, are, these are just important things I'm thinking about. Fish would probably go around here, probably around the 115 to 130 range. If it's more fatty, I like to cook it closer to 130. If it's more lean, cook it a little bit lower. Um, so yeah, something to think about. Another temperature that's extremely important. Now we're gonna get a little more technical when it comes to sous vide specifically. Uh, 120, did that say 127? Okay. So 127 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a very important number when it comes to sous-viding things. 
And there's a term called pasteurization, which you've probably heard before when it comes to like eggs or milk. But 127 degrees, I'll write F here, Fahrenheit is extremely important when it comes to pasteurization because that's the lowest temperature in which pasteurization, uh, pasteurization can start to occur. Okay, so pasteurization is essentially the temperature where all bacteria dies and it's guaranteed safe to eat. So when you get eggs, when you get milk that says it's been pasteurized, you know it's been heated to a certain temperature in which all bacteria, all potentially bad bacteria has been killed. So pasteurization comes through time and temperature. Okay, so there's a relationship there between time and temperature that we're gonna talk a little bit more about in the next few minutes. Um, but 127 degrees Fahrenheit is the lowest possible temperature in which pasteurization can occur. So I mentioned there's a relationship. At 127, it's a very low temperature. It requires a really extended amount of time in that, at that temperature to fully pasteurize. Whereas, let's say we're at 165, things immediately pasteurize. So that's why the FDA talks about 165 Fahrenheit for chicken, right? Because that's the point where after zero seconds, literally one millisecond, you know the chicken's safe if, if it reaches 165. But what they don't tell you is that, let's say you leave chicken in an, in an environment that's around 130, 140, depending really anywhere in this range, it can actually pasteurize, which means you can eat medium rare chicken. Will it be tasty? I have no idea. I've never eaten medium rare chicken, but I have some medium rare chicken here that has been fully pasteurized. Um, so stay tuned to find out if I actually eat it, but this has been cooked for six hours at 135 degrees Fahrenheit. So roughly medium rare for a steak, which means it's medium rare chicken, but it's totally safe to eat. So I don't know, we'll see if we actually take a bite and we'll see how it looks when I cut into it. I don't have high hopes, but yeah, we shall see. Okay, so those are the first two concepts that I've talked about. I hope people are following along relatively well. Um, it's a little bit, it's a bit of a confusing subject, but um, yeah, something I didn't mention is that sous vide, um, I, I don't consider it to be like the best possible way to cook something. I see it as a technique that you can add to your toolbox. It allows for a lot of flexibility when it comes to cooking a wide range of things. And not too many people understand it super well, but as I mentioned, it allows for a lot of flexibility and it's fun and you can make some really great stuff with it. So let's continue. Next up we have, so I was talking about the relationship between time and temperature and it's quite important there's a little bit of a glare. Uh, I think it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. So, not so we mentioned we talked about pasteurization and how important that can be. There's also a relationship with time and temperature in regards to tenderness. Okay. So, look, take a look at this chart. Try to kind of understand it. I'll, I'll talk through it. But again, we have time here. Okay. So time increases, and we have temperature. So temperature increases. So as I mentioned, the FDA states that uh, chicken and pretty much all proteins are immediately safe to eat at 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so coming down here, we have our temperature set at 165. Really, this should actually go to the bottom of the x-axis. But at 165, the time is very low in terms of how fast it'll pasteurize. It'll actually pasteurize immediately. Now compare it to 135, right? The amount of time it takes to pasteurize it's actually past 60 minutes, it's just a little bit longer. But for example, if you leave a chicken breast in at a sous vide bath or anything at 135 for an extended period of time, you'll have pasteurized the chicken. Um, it's similar when it comes to pork, beef, chicken, in terms of how long it takes to pasteurize. There's charts that I can send people if they wanna look at it. Um, but yeah, just something to think about. Like for example, when you're cooking a steak, and you wanna cook it rare, right? Let's say the, fi the finishing temperature is like 125 degrees Fahrenheit or even 130 Fahrenheit. That steak only spends maybe five to 15 minutes in that temperature zone. So that steak is not pasteurized technically, right? So something to think about as you're cooking a steak and um, really cooking any type of protein because a lot of the stuff we eat technically isn't pasteurized, but I don't think that's a problem. 
Okay, so we talked about pasteurization. Now we're gonna talk about tenderness. It's actually very similar to the relationship between time and temperature uh, with pasteurization, um, when it, but yeah, similar when it comes to tender, tenderness. So, looking back here, bar barbecue, right? This, these are really tough cuts of, of meat, whether it's pork or beef. It requires a very high temperature to tenderize it, right? If you just cooked a, a brisket, oh, if you cooked a brisket to medium rare, it would be really tough. But since we cook it to 205 degrees Fahrenheit, it's extremely tender. So temperature will give you a tender product, but time will also give you a, a tender product. So it's the exact same curve. The numbers here are different, but we have the time and temperature curve. So for example, at a very high temperature, it only needs a small amount of time, right? The y-axis here needs to be, it's a small amount of time to tenderize a brisket, right? Once, once a brisket reaches 205 five degrees Fahrenheit, roughly, it's gonna tenderize, okay? But the same goes for a low amount of temperature, or, or the opposite's true for a low amount of temperature. Let's say we cook that same brisket at 135 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Typically, you would never cook a brisket to 135, but if you did, and you just extended the time period to let's say, so again, these are, these are wrong, but let's say 72 hours. If you cooked a brisket at 135 degrees Fahrenheit for 72 hours, it would be extremely tender, right? So that just shows that yes, temperature is important, but we also have a variable at play that you only have at your disposal if you're sous vide things. And that's where things can get really interesting, in my opinion, because um, I mentioned the flexibility aspect, but you can really change tenderness without necessarily overcooking something. So like a brisket, people always say in the comment section, oh, he overcooked the brisket. You kind of have to do that with traditional cooking methods to make it tender. But when you sous vide something, and I'm actually gonna show you how, you can keep your temperature low and just extend the amount of time. So let's quickly talk about the, the samples. How are we doing on time? It's been 23 minutes. I told myself I'd do about a half an hour. So let's now cut into our examples. Everyone said you should be a teacher. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's see what we have here. So we have a couple different things. So over the past few days, I've been sous vide things just to show you guys how things work. Example number one is 135 degrees for 48 hours. It was actually closer to like 60 hours. Um, also, these are all short ribs, so they would fall into the classification of barbecue that requires typically very high temperatures to um, tenderize. So it usually requires high temperatures, but in this case, we did it at 135 Fahrenheit, which is roughly medium rare. Now, for comparison, we did another short rib, again at 135, but brought the amount of time down to four hours, as opposed to to the 60 that we had here, we have four hours. So we can compare um, differences in, in tenderness based on that. And then we also have, okay, so another interesting one, again, a short rib. So just trying to like see how it fits on this whole curve. Another short rib, but in this case, we brought down the time and increased the temperature compared to these two. So this is 180 degrees Fahrenheit for only about 10 hours, okay? So let's just think about how these fit on the scale. 135 for 48 hours, okay? Low temperature, but extremely high amount of time. Hopefully it's tender, we'll find out. The next one, extremely high temperature of 180, but relatively low uh, amount of time in comparison. So let's, uh, let's cut into these just to show what we got. Um, so, so I guess this is a good time to explain how sous vide actually works. So you, you put it in the bag, right? You cook it for X amount of time and then it looks like this. It looks nasty. Um, the next step and you, and you can see there's a lot of juices in here. I like to res reserve those. It's, it's a really concentrated beef stock. Um, it's essentially just like a, a beef soup type thing. Looks weird, but flavor's good. 
So here we have our 135 for 48 hours. Okay, we're gonna take that out. Do one of each. You can tell it's relatively tender. That's one. Okay, next. Someone said it's gonna taste like a plastic bag. Um, it's not gonna taste like a plastic bag, fortunately. Um, yeah, that's something I kind of was worried about when I first started. But these are these bags are spe specifically meant to uh, oh shoot be cooked to high temperatures for extended period of, periods of time. Um, on, another big misconception that I almost always hear when I when I sous vide something is that sous vide is uh, equivalent to boiling something, and it's a really I, I understand that thought process, but it's it's they're very, very different um, situations. One, the food is never exposed to water itself. So everything is contained in here. The only liquid came from um, the meat itself. You can add herbs, you can add, you can, you can add a wet marinade. My experience hasn't been great with it, but it's never exposed to, to water and it's never uh, actually cooked to that high of a, so, Boiling water is cooked to like two, is at 212 Fahrenheit. Whereas this, I mean, these temperatures never exceeded, in that case, 180, and in this case, 135. So um, it's definitely something that you have to experience for yourself to truly understand. And a lot of diehard barbecue pe people or traditionalists, they really uh, dislike the concept. But I would say just give it a shot, and you might be surprised with what you think. So we have three short ribs here. Again, they don't look pretty, but that's okay. So once they've been sous vide, they're now fully cooked. And in, the, in both cases, they're fully pasteurized, as we talked about. Um, so we don't need to cook them anymore, but we do need to build some color and get some crust going. Um, they, they, they do look weird right now. So there's a few ways to build crust. One is grilling directly over fire. You can do it on a cast iron or you can use a torch, which is what I'm gonna to use today. So just so I remember, this is the, the, 180, the 180, this is the 135 for a long period of time, and this is the 135 for a short amount of time. So a short amount of time, 135, 180. Okay, so I'm gonna get my torch. So today, we could have used a cast iron, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to use the torch. Um, people are saying, what's he cooking? I'm trying not to do comments yet, but we're explaining sous vide using a few different examples. So I'm going to use the torch and quickly sear them. I'm not going to go crazy with it. I also already um, seasoned them. So I, I prefer seasoning before sous vide. Some people do it after, but um, I've had success with doing it before. So I'm going to quickly uh, uh, sear them. took a relatively long time. People are saying map gas. Map gas is totally fine to use. People say, oh, you're using map gas and not butane. Why would butane be any better? This actually burns cleaner than, than butane um, and leaves less of a gassy type smell. So that's one point. Torch it. Okay, so really the important part here is less about like having it taste perfect, we, we would have ideally had added a sauce or done a variety of things to, you know, present it better. But really, I'm more interested in showing you guys from a textural component how different lengths of time with different temperatures can be achieved using sous vide. 
Um, very different than if you were using a traditional method. So the first thing we're going to do is get a knife. One second. Okay. I'm using a small knife today. So the first one we're going to talk about is this guy right here. A little beef short rib. Okay. This one's been cooked at 180 degrees Fahrenheit for, what did I say? About 10 hours. I probably would have liked to have gone about 12 hours with this, but we should be able to get a fairly soft texture, similar to like a braised short rib, given this length of time. So let's see. Um, I'm gonna get a glove. So, because we went with a relatively high temperature, we didn't have to cook it for too, too long. And my goal is that it's gonna be quite tender, almost like a braised short rib type texture um, with very limited work, right? Like it was very easy to achieve this, but let's see how we did. So this glove is not really fitting right. <laughs> oh God, get on there. Okay, so I hate to just like pull it apart, but I wanna show you guys the texture and I think using my hands probably the best way. So I'm just gonna like open it up. And as you can see, it's, pretty tender, right? Like beef short rib is generally a pretty tough cut, but as you can see, it's pretty much just falling apart. You can see it's fully rendered, right? No smoke ring because we didn't smoke it, but it's a very similar uh, texture as if we were gonna cook it um, low and slow on like a grill, right? I, I hope you guys can see it. But you can see the strands are quite, you know, they're coming apart pretty nicely without much work. Uh, it's, it's always going to be juicy because it's, it's so well marked. I'm not going to say it's always going to be juicy, um, but let me just taste it. Yeah, it tastes like a braised short rib. Um, so that was 180 for 10 hours. Low temp, uh, high temperature, low amount of time. Okay. Now, the one I'm more, I'm more excited about is looking at the 135 for about 50 hours. So exact same, I got these short ribs the same day, they look the same, right? But the texture should be quite, maybe not different, but just have a different element to it. So this one, I hate to just break it open. I almost wanna cut this one because the idea is that we, we essentially cook this to medium rare. Right, if you're gonna cook a short rib to medium rare, it's gonna be tough. And in fact, we have one that we cooked to medium rare, but we did it over a sh short amount of time. So I'm actually gonna start with this one. Okay, so this one was cooked for about six hours at 135. So medium rare, but short amount of time. So we, as you can see, it's nice and pink on the inside, but it's not, it's not tender, right? Like I'm having a hard time. It's, it's pasteurized, it's cooked fully, but it is definitely not tender at all. It's kind of a weird way to do this, but um, I don't know. I hope you guys can tell. It's You can see it's medium rare, right? 135. Look at the difference in color, right? This one's cooked to 180. This one's cooked to 130. Is this weird, Sophia? It's cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this one's cooked to medium rare, right? 135 Fahrenheit, but I didn't cook it long enough. It never had time uh, to tenderize. But this one here is a different story, hopefully, because we cooked this one for about five times that length of time. So not only is this one medium rare, but it's extremely tender, right? It's just completely falling apart, right? So same texture as the 180 for 10 hours, but you can see it's pink on the inside, right? So look at that. Similar texture to this one. This one's well done. Very, very tender. However, it's medium rare. So this is where you can get really creative with sous vide because you can cook things like this that typically need to be cooked to well done because it's barbecue, right? It typically requires very high temperature, but because we messed with that other variable, which is time, it allowed us to achieve this really cool thing. So that's that. Uh, concept. The last thing we're going to talk about, and I'm actually not looking forward to it, is the medium rare chicken. <sighs> I, uh, I'm still not sure if I'm actually going to eat this, 
especially on a lot. Like I've never, I actually did have raw chicken once in Japan, but it was expertly prepared and it was like a whole thing. But this <laughs> is prepared by me. And let's get back to this little situation. We have our pasteurization. I'm really hoping that all the sources that I use online are correct because what they tell me is that if you hold chicken at 135, really anything over 130 you're safe, but 135, and you hold it for an extended period of time, in, in this case, six hours, which is way past necessary, so it's definitely pasteurized, but, but the texture is probably gonna be closer to medium rare chicken than, than normal chicken. So, I don't know, do you guys think I should eat it? Or, like, am I currently creating a meme where someone's like recording their screen and then I'm gonna be like on the news, like, idiot eats raw chicken. I have a feeling that might be happening. But should I eat it? Rubber and nasty. Okay, a lot of people saying no. One person saying yes. YouTube saying yes. People. Man, I, uh, well, okay, we know it's safe to eat. That's the one thing we know. Um, I'm gonna cut into it just to see what it looks like. Do you guys think it's gonna be pink or like pale? Oh, this is nasty. I, I'm, I'm, I didn't even sear it. So like, another thing is like, you can sous vide stuff and not sear it. It's still perfectly safe to eat. If I cook this to a higher temperature, like sometimes people sous vide chicken breast, cook it to like 150, um, totally safe, and they keep it cold and put it into chicken salad, which is a great meal prep thing. But yeah, 135 is a little bit of a different story. So I'm gonna cut into it. I'm gonna be honest, it doesn't look that bad. I was expecting it to be like really pink, but that's 135 degrees Fahrenheit chicken, AKA medium rare chicken. <laughs> Sophia, do you wanna do the honors? <laughs> Really? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, like it doesn't look, it doesn't look bad. People are saying it looks good. Okay, everyone's saying it looks good. All right. I'm gonna just try a little bite. Don't do it? You think no? Do it. Do a little bite. Do a little bite. All right, whatever. Tastes like chicken. <laughs> no, I mean it, I'm not gonna say it's like my favorite, but it's not terrible. Like it still just tastes like chicken. Um, I was expecting it to be like really raw looking, but it really doesn't look that bad. We could have gone lower. Maybe we, I'll probably do a video on this going as low as possible. But yeah, interesting. So 135 Fahrenheit. We did it. <laughs> um, okay, so we're 10 minutes over schedule, but I think we, we nailed most of the concepts that I wanted to talk about. Let me see if I, I wrote a couple. Oh, did my computer die? Oh, no. There's a couple final things that I just want to quickly list off that are just like rapid fire things that might be helpful if you're considering sous vide. So one, I like to season before. You can season after, but I like to season before. I find that dry ingredients are better than wet if you're gonna put it in the bag and you really don't wanna put a whole marinated thing. It's okay to put something that's been marinated, but remove the marinade before you sous vide it because all the stuff in the, in the marinade are gonna start, is gonna start cooking and it can get a little weird. So dry ingredients are better in my opinion. Um, you can use a vacuum bag or a Ziploc. Both are totally safe. Make sure you just get a, hot, a, a heavy duty Ziploc. Oh, shocking your food after you sous vide it. So something that I like to do is after sous vide something, put it in a cold, in a, in a, like a ice bath plunge to bring down the temperature. Cause when you sear it, you really don't want to uh, continue cooking it to a higher temperature. So slightly cooling it down so that when you sear it, you don't um, increase the temp. And these are things we can talk about in the q and I'm actually gonna shut this off or uh, close down the live in about like two minutes and then we'll do, I'll reopen a new one and we'll do Q&A on Instagram. Um, so how to sear cast iron torch or grill. Make sure you dry it off really well beforehand. 
And okay, the final point, for most things that you're cooking, like a steak, like chicken, um, things that, oh, actually I, I, had them, I had it written here. Things that are tender in general. So fish, a steak, a chicken breast, um, a pork chop. Limit your sous vide time to about one to four hours. The thicker, the thicker it is, the longer you should go in that four, one to four hour range. But one to four hours, you're not gonna have any textural changes to the food. Um, now, if you're talking about something that's, that's really tough, like a short rib, like a brisket, um, then you're looking at like six to 72 hours. And you really don't wanna go above 72 hours. Um, but yeah, those are the ranges that I think about. Okay, that's pretty much it. I'm gonna shut this off now so that people that are watching this in the future can just have a relatively concise thing to look at. And then I'm gonna restart an Instagram Live in maybe like 10 minutes and we will do a little more Q&A. So people on YouTube, come over to Instagram if you're interested in the Q&A and yeah, I'll see you guys there in a little bit. I will be back very soon. All right, people on YouTube, What's up guys? I just, Sophia, do you mind helping me with this please? I'll do a quick little Q&A on YouTube just because we're, uh, yeah, that one. Because we're gonna end soon. Hope you guys are doing well, what's up? Stay safe, don't die. Yeah, guys, medium rare chicken. Muy interesante. Um, I'm probably just gonna end this now too, actually. But we'll uh, come over to Instagram a little bit later if you're interested in doing some Q&A. And thank you guys, I appreciate it.